Sharma, who's been with us here twice already at the Mughal Tent, has worked as a political journalist for 22 years. She is the author of four novels dwelling on the themes of farmer suicides, gender issues, and media and political ethics in India, as well as two books in spirituality. Her third novel, Shoes of the Dead, was a critique of the inheritance of political power in India and is being made into a film. Her upcoming non-fiction book, Widows of Vidarbha, Making of Shadows, is based on the lives of farm widows in rural India. <clears throat> Sarah Raven's Gardening and Cookery books have won her a number of awards, including Best Specialist Gardening Book for the Cutting Garden and Cookery Book of the Year for Sarah Raven's Garden Cookbook. Her other titles include Vita Sackwell, West. Sissinghurst, The Creation of a Garden, Food for Friends and Family, and Complete Christmas. Raven's latest book is Good Good Food, which explores healthy eating through combining her medical training as a GP with her love for growing and cooking food. Latika George, who is also with us, is a writer, landscape designer, environmentalist, and an organic gardener. She is the author of The Kerala Kitchen, adapted for India as the Suryani Kitchen and she has published articles on food, design, travel, gardening, and the environment in Inside Outside, Architectural Digest, Food 52, and Hindu Blink, amongst others. Um, her next book, Mother Earth, Sister Seed, Travels to India's Farmlands, will be published in January 2018, which is now. <laughs> Veer Sangvi is a columnist and a television presenter. He was the editor and later editorial director of the Hindustan Times from 1999 to 2008. He is currently a columnist for the paper. He is a resident commentator on CNN News 18, where he also anchors a weekly show called Virtuosity. His most recent book is Mandate, and it was published in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, can you hear me? Mic sir. Yeah, I think you should take this stool away. I'm short, but not that short. I think that's a little better. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm relieved to see there are more of you than there were this morning when we began our session at 10 a.m. that unearthed we are. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. Please keep tweeting. Please keep taking pictures. If there's anyone here from JLF Insider, which is really my favorite handle, this is for you. If you've been following the tweets, you'll know what that's about. Uh, I don't actually make out these panels, so don't hold me responsible for the fact that we have three very different people talking about a very generic subject. So what I'm going to do, rather than sort of try and weave everything together in a conversation to begin with, is give each of them five minutes to make a presentation to tell us what they think. Then we'll try and weave it into a conversation. And then hopefully, we'll be able to throw that open. I asked them to pick who would do it first. And Kota Lilima has agreed to be the first person who will speak. So Kota. May I speak from here? Thank you, Veer. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk about something which many of us are aware of in this country. That's about um, the food which is offered to God and the reasons why, or rather, how and why. So let me just. Um, Describe a little about the food itself and what's it called. Okay, there's a honeybee here. Okay. Um, the food offerings to God, known, as, known in Sanskrit as naivedyam, are done by priests of the temple and at designated times of the day. The food is essentially very simple. It is sattvic in nature and does not contain any spices, chilies, and other things like that. Ingredients are mostly donated by the community. Con they contain pulses, grain, milk, and fruit. Uh, <clears throat> the food thereafter is shared by the devotees. And uh, it's then called prasadam or prasad. And it, it is supposed to contain the blessings of God. And it's supposed to be very auspicious to receive such food. And it's supposed to fulfill the desires of the devotee. Now, there were several reasons why I had decided to explore this particular tradition, and I, uh, I'm a, a, a researcher in rural India. I, I write about 
villages, farmer suicides, poverty, widows, gender issues. Um, and I've seen an immense amount of suffering and pain in the villages of India in almost every corner. But at the same time, I've also seen a great amount of faith and belief in God. So I approach this subject from the position of doubt rather than faith. Um, questions like, is there God? Is God to the creation of the world? <clears throat> what drives our senses, our choices? What is the cause and the cause of all causes? These are some of the questions which are part of the Hindu texts, the Hindu books, in, books on Hinduism. But I try to ask similar questions about food. So some of the questions are, does God require food? The way we mortals understand food? Does God consume food? You offer food to God, but as I said, I come from a, from a place of skepticism. I come from a place of doubt. So these were some of my doubts. Um, do we know what kind of food God likes? And if she or he wanted different kinds of food, how would they tell us? So, uh, but most importantly, I guess, why does God need food? Does the Almighty Supreme actually also feel hunger? So these weren't the questions of the faithful, and, um, but I wanted my faith to be reasoned. If I would discover faith, I wanted it to be reasoned and not blind. In my endeavor, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, find the guidance of my co-author in this book, uh, the chief priest of the Tirumala temple, um, uh, Dr. A.V. Ramana Dikshitilagaru. He uh, guided me through the various stages of the exploration to find the answers to the doubts I had. And we have therefore put together this book called Sacred Foods of God in Tirumala, uh, based on the texts like the Agama Shastras and also the epigraphic evidence which is found on the temple walls uh, we have also tried to incorporate some of that. Um, we have just five minutes, can I? Okay, well, I have just two minutes, so I'll briefly talk about the inscriptions, and then perhaps later on uh, we can discuss about the uh, uh, Naivedim itself. The Tirumala temple is one of the oldest and the most popular temples of Hinduism in the world, uh, and on its walls are, is etched the history of the temple, which also talks about the food offerings. Um, many of these practices which are followed today look very simple, but they have great resonance with the devotees. <clears throat> and in this book, we have presented some of these inscriptions and the translations into the English language. Um, there are mentions of powerful people, influential donors uh, who had covered the walls with gold and uh, added another free food service to thousands of people. But most often are the mentions of ordinary people, farmers, businessmen, regular people, who had made small donations for the temple upkeep. And even today, it is the devotion of these regular people which makes the temple what it is. Um, I shall discuss a little more probably in the discussion later about whether I found the faith uh, to believe in these food offerings or not, or my doubts still remain the way they are. Thank you. Can I now ask Sarah to speak for a few minutes? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Raven, and uh, mine is, is, is not a spiritual uh, chat. It's much more a bodily chat. Um, and about food and health, I started my working life training to be a doctor, and um, so I spent seven years training. And in the seven years of medical training, I received two hours of teaching about nutrition. And for me, that was a very shocking and extraordinary thing because, of course, health is about prevention rather than treatment. And uh, our whole Western culture is completely booked into the idea that you have a doctor to treat a disease rather than you have some kind of guru or, or some guidance as to how to avoid disease. And so um, I came out of medicine after eight years, so I did two years of practicing, 
and became a gardener and a grower of food um, and, uh, and of cut flowers, but and a lot of, about vegetables. And so I then spent the next 15 years of my life um, growing and cooking and teaching and writing about food, mainly vegetables. And then, of course, inevitably, I wanted to link the two. And so I then went back into discovering and learning about nutrition and about how vegetables and fruit um, can make you better and avoid disease. So they can treat disease, but also avoid disease. But I was just explaining earlier that I, I ended up with a book that was um, 150,000 words long and incredibly boring um, because it was full of really turgid medical stuff. And I, I just decided one day to throw it away and then just to write a cookbook with very short bits on nutrition, um, which was, in a way, very tragic. But I realized there was no point writing this very boring book, however earnest and worthy and educative it was. And so I then wrote um, 400 recipes around the, the food that I felt were the most healthy, that I felt as a cook... Um, in uh, our culture, but using a lot of different uh, cuisines that, that really were, was cooking for health. And um, so it's, 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 I hope, joyful and colorful, um, but it is about health. And, and that really um, took me into lots of interesting areas. For instance, do you peel or do you not peel? You know, if you have a carrot or a squash or a sweet potato, do you peel or do you not peel? So, you know, there have been great uh, food scandals in the UK about there being different bacteria, and so you should peel the outside of your carrot. But of course, if you think about a root, a root has to have its own defense system, and its defense system is made of antioxidants. That's what keeps disease at bay. They have their own disease prevention barrier, and if you peel, that is where the highest concentration of the antioxidant is. So you peel away not all the goodness, but a huge proportion of the goodness. So you definitely do not peel. But then you come on to organic and non-organic. And maybe I, I think we're going to talk about that later. So we, we don't have to discuss that. But it sort of led me into, into lots of interesting debates about all of that stuff. How to treat your food. Do you eat raw or do you eat cooked? Do you get it? You know, the raw foodists believe that you shouldn't heat food to greater than 30 degrees. Um, because you will then get a higher mineral and nutrient content. But then there are the others that with kale, which has something in it called glucosinolate, that, in fact, is only digestible cooked. So, again, it's not simple. So it's true that um, certain things are better not cooked. The vitamin C uh, fruits and things are better not cooked because vitamin C degrades at a very low temperature. But it is not true of all things. And so you need a good mix. You need a good mix of colors. You need a good mix of raw and cooked. And so it's, it's a sort of wonderful, complex story. But basically, the take home from the end of all my research was just have a predominantly vegetable-based diet, but protein is very important, and to really concentrate on having a broad spectrum. So never the same food every day. You know, I was brought up in a household where we had one thing on Monday, one thing on Tuesday, one thing on Wednesday. The following Monday, it was the same as the previous Monday. The following Tuesday, it was the same as the previous Tuesday. Not so good, not so healthy. You know, as wide a range as you can possibly have. Thanks, sir. That leaves you. Writing a cookbook was never in my plans. I'd never even thought I dreamt I would be writing a cookbook. I'm a home cook. But when a publisher in New York asked me to write a, a book, a cookbook about my community, about the foods of my community, the Syrian Christians of Kerala, what better way to, I mean, explain my community than through food? Food explains so much about a community, who we are, what we eat, why we eat the way, the way we do, why we grow food the way we do. And I think it led to, it became a catalyst to understanding my community a little better. It took me, I think, a year to write my book, but there was no guidance of sorts. There was no tome of Syrian Christian recipes, I mean, or, expl or, or, or an explanation 
to the foods uh, of, um, of my community. So what did I do? I went out to my relatives, old grandmothers, family homes, and asked them, what are your recipes? Why do you cook the way you do? And all over Kerala, Kerala is a tiny state, and Syrian Christians are spread all over the state. So the, I discovered that the Syrian Christians of each area had sort of adapted to that area and basically cooked the foods that they found over there. <laughs> So I, in a way, I was trying to understand my community, a uh, community of hardy agriculturists who became businessmen later, traveled the world, adapted new foods. They seem to actually want to learn, new, learn more about new cultures and adapt that into their uh, daily routine. And that's exactly what they did. They brought new foods into Kerala. They took their foods out into different distant lands. And that sort of became what my cookbook was about. But more than that, it was all about stories. I think food is never all merely about just food, nourishment. It's about stories. It's about where we got fish from that day. So that's another thing. In many cultures, one of the first questions, I mean, it's almost a form of greeting, especially in China. It's like, have you eaten already? In Kerala, it's like, did you find fish today? What fish did you find? And where did that fish come from? So that fish led to a lot of other stories. Where did you get it from? What kind of fish was it? it is, is it seasonal? How are you going to cook it today? Who's coming for lunch? And I mean, it led to a lot of stories. So most of the stories in my, I mean, the recipes in my book come with stories and memories. Yes, memories are another thing. So after my parents died, this was a way to reconnect with my family uh, my childhood, childhood summers in Kerala, foods that we ate, the stories we shared. I think nothing does that better than food. So, I mean, that's what the book is about. It's about food, it's about memories, it's about nostalgia. And I think most immigrants and people who travel to distant lands, this is what they took, take, even if they don't take, I mean, clothes, they will take their recipes with them, the recipes and their memories. Yeah. So, I mean, I think food is basically about who we are. I mean, it, de it defines us like nothing else. Who, what we eat is really who we are. How we nourish ourselves, how we feed our families, how we try to extend that to the people around us. There's nothing more defining than food. And I suppose every community, every culture finds its own way of doing that. Syrian, Syrian Christians are no less. This is what we do. We're a tiny community in Kerala, but I think we've taken our food to them, many cities and across the world now. And it's definitely who we are, defines us as a, as a community, a tiny minority in the state of Kerala. So thanks. Thank you. Three very interesting presentations. And as I said, three very different presentations. Let's see how we can weave this into a conversation. Uh, shall we start with the obvious question? Nilima, you posed this question. Does, is God a foodie? Does he like food? Why this connection between religion and God? Why is it so important to give an idol often offerings? What's the logic? Well, there's a great amount of thought that has been put into this uh, particular question, especially the answer to it. The Hindu uh, texts are full of it. God definitely seems to be a foodie. He seems to be very fond of food. Mm. He or she. Uh, I was going to say that. She. Yeah, she uh, Given that for once we don't have a manual, let's just say she. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, seems to be very fond of food, very fond of very different kinds of food. Um, I think that's true for sacred food offerings across the world in various temples, as we were discussing before, uh, and, and uh, different places of worship. Um, also, <coughs> the preparation of food for God seems to be a sense of uh, 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 an act of devotion in itself. So it's, it's not as if the God would accept or reject the food or consume the food. It is the act of offering the food, which seems to be a, um, a, the sacred act or the act of devotion. So in that sense, and in the kind of 
foods which we offer mm. uh, to God. I think um, I think it's one of the most spectacular rituals of uh, any religion and definitely of the Tirumala temple. But I mean, it varies. We think of the food of God as being stuff she likes like prashad. But in your book, the recipes are for everything from Italy to dosa or whatever, right? Yeah, pretty much everything. So this is a God who likes all kinds of food. Absolutely. The, the, uh, the, the kinds which would uh, hike up cholesterol, probably put on <laughs> weight. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's, that's God, right? He can basically get And these are it. traditional recipes. They are very traditional yep. recipes. They have um, a, a very nice way of preparing. Um, the cooks actually enjoy doing what they do. They spend an entire day thinking about what they're going to do next morning, how they're going to cook it. So, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of involvement in the, in, the, in, the, in the thing, and there's a lot of enthusiasm and affection. Uh, it's not like God is someone separate from the person. So, it's almost like you're cooking for someone you love, you know, or someone you totally worship. Okay. Sarah, there is this view. I mean, it's a sort of trendy view among some cookbook writers and food writers which is that what is wrong with our society today is the kind of industrial processed food we eat. The food of our ancestors was so healthy, it was so perfect, it's all been ruined. If you look at the recipes in her book, as she said, they're cholesterol rich, they're laden with every unhealthy ingredient you can think of, and they're hundreds of years old. So are we romanticizing what our ancestors used to eat? I think... Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's obviously difficult for me to surmise things from um, the culture here, but, uh, but I'm going to try. <laughs> okay. um, which is that I think uh, there is a romanticism because I think poverty in, in all our cultures was such a massive thing, and with poverty came a very limited diet. Yeah. And um, so the high cholesterol issue would have been something for a very, 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 very limited um, part of um, all our societies and um, over a very limited period of time, probably, and so it would be high days and holidays, and then it's completely fine. I mean, I think huge levels of dairy on a daily basis is probably not good for you, but I think, historically, that would not have, have been the case. But I think one does tend to think back that it was always better, and I think it wasn't. I think the diet was yeah. incredibly impoverished. Well, Hinduism is sort of founded on the back of dairy products, right? from makhanchor to ghee on every, in, during every puja. If, you, if God had not created the cow, there would be no Hinduism. Probably not. not right? <laughs> uh, uh, there won't be any lambs, there won't be any kheer. Yeah. Uh, there won't be wonderful stuff which uh, are offered in the temples. But also that meant that the, uh, the cattle had to be protected, they had to be taken yep. care of. Not in the cow protection way. We, not we, in the we are, way, the, not in the way they want to do it in Rajasthan these days, yes, perhaps. But yeah. Not in that sense yeah, yeah. at all. Yeah. But actually to take care of these uh, animals and water and plants and, you know, the agriculture. So God may or may not be a foodie, but she was certainly not lactose intolerant. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, and also didn't mind gluten at all, you know. So God, yeah. Yeah. God had no allergies. No, no allergies yeah. at all. all. I want to talk to you about the Syrian Christian community. I, do, I don't know how many people realize this, but the Syrian Christians of Kerala are the world's oldest practical, practicing Christians. They were Christians when most of the Christian, when the Pope's ancestors were probably living in trees. The legend is, and it's a legend that's been disputed, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that St. Thomas, the doubting Thomas of the Bible, came to India, landed in India, and <coughs> converted the Syrian Christians. And that community has remained Christian to this present day. That's yeah, roughly yeah, correct. Absolutely right. That's yeah. roughly correct, that, right? That is, that is what we believe in. And, uh, I don't and yet your Christianity, the kind of Christianity and the kind of food you eat, would have changed over the years, partly after other kinds of Christians arrived in India as well. Right? Absolutely. So explain that to us. Absolutely. I think in uh, the years following our conversion, we were practically Hindu in always. We probably absorbed a lot of the uh, traditions, food traditions of the merchant traders who we yep. had a lot of connections with. But in every other way, other than the fact that we followed Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, we actually were Hindu in, in practically every way. Uh, uh, forms of but worship. you ate beef. 
uh, but we ate beef. You ate beef. We ate that everything, was, That was the important difference. <laughs> yeah. You had no dietary restrictions. Yeah, but I you think... You may have had the dairy products, but you had the beef we as well. Yeah? yeah, we don't have much dairy products in Canada. You don't, it's yeah. coconut so milk, actually. Yeah, so that's interesting. So coconut milk is yeah. the basis of almost all our foods. Yeah. But uh, the, we did not eat pork till very recently, till the Portuguese arrived, actually. So with the arrival of the Portuguese, many of our dietary habits changed. I do believe also that beef was also much, much later uh, along with the arrival of the Portuguese. So it was, we were mainly fish eaters. And I think most Syrian Christians were agriculturists, so we grew tapioca and vegetables. We were hill people. Yeah. Uh, we were lived in the backwaters where we had mostly fish. So I think more, both, meat, both meats are with the arrival of the Portuguese. So when you talk about Syrian Christian food today, as we tend to, how does it differ from the food of the rest of Kerala? From the rest of Kerala, I think Syrian Christians have a way of sort of adapting to their surroundings. So if, if it is in a prominently uh, Muslim area like Calicut, we make their biryanis and their uh, parotas. Uh, so in fact, the only Middle Eastern uh, connection is what we have from most, more recent connections. And if we live in an area like Palgat, we tend to be more vegetarian. Mm -hmm. And pro uh, backwaters like where I am from, it, we're all fish and tapioca eaters. So we kind of change with the geography, I think. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sir, there is, as you know, sir, in India, a tradition that when it's a holy day, you're a vegetarian. If you go to a temple, you're a vegetarian. In most, I think perhaps all temples, the food is almost always vegetarian. Do we think now, given what we know about nutrition, that our ancestors knew a thing or two? It was a good I, idea to be so vegetarian? I think, one, I think the, um, the vegetarian moving into the vegan thing is, is a very interesting debate, which is incredibly sort of current. And um, I think undoubtedly it's extremely easy to have a very, very healthy diet if you're vegetarian. Um, I think if you move into veganism, you are in real danger of excluding too much protein. And um, there's, there's very interesting research, particularly with weight, um, that's just coming out at the moment, that if you eat three mouthfuls of protein before you start the rest of the things on your plate, you actually decrease the amount you eat by a quarter. So because it, it, it engages with the hunger pathways into your brain and protein releases um, a, a hormone, a chemical, which makes you feel replete quicker. So if you start your meal with a protein rather than a carbohydrate, which is what we many of us do, or perhaps a vegetable, you actually will, even just by doing that, decrease your weight gradually. Uh, things like that, um, and obviously meat plays an important role as a protein. It doesn't have to be meat, but you have to be a good cook. And also if you exclude eggs, and dairy, so you're relying on nuts and pulses. You have to be a very good cook to be a vegan, and I think you have to be a much better cook and a more educated cook to have a healthy diet, even as a vegetarian, because you have to remember the protein. But does it actually make sense to be a vegan from a medical standpoint? Because it's become very trendy now to say no dairy, but does that make sense? Well, I, one of the things that I think is very, very important to think about is your gut health, and particularly, I'm very interested in the immune system, and uh, more and more research is emerging now about the importance of the gut on the immune system, so much so that I'm sure you're all bored to tears with it, so I'm not going to really go into it, but, but there is no doubt that things like kefir which, and, and, and a really proper raw yogurt, which is that something that you have in your diet much more naturally in India than we do um, in the UK, is unbelievably important and to have a broad spectrum of lactobacillus in your gut seems to be one of the most important things in protecting you against uh, bacterial disease so uh, and viral diseases like the cough and the cold uh, etc but also more profound diseases cancer alzheimer's you know cardiovascular as well as central nervous system diseases um, and so without doubt excluding dairy i think comes at a big cost Latika, we talked yesterday when we met briefly about food and culture. Do you think in some ways the food of the Syrian Christians reflects the culture of that very microscopic yet important community? Uh, I think it does. Actually, I believe that we are very pragmatic and we sort of actually go with the flow wherever we are. 
as you know, a large section of Syrian Christians actually, Keralites, live out of the state. Yeah. Uh, they live all over well, the world. Well, large sections of Malayalis live outside the yeah, state. Yeah, all, all Mainly Malayalis. in the Gulf. But Mainly in the Gulf, Gulf in yeah. America. We're yeah. doctors, we're surgeons, we're nurses. So we, we're all over the place. And one of the things we carry with us is our culture and our food. I mean, we never leave it behind. So I, I think, I mean, that's what we take with us. So, I mean, Malayalis, I think maybe most communities do that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So maybe as a Syrian Christian, I think most that we do it more than others. But I'm quite sure that all all communities do that. Well, the British brought their cuisine to India, and I think left not much of an imprint, if you don't mind my <laughs> saying so. Which if you very eaten, fair comment. Yeah, which you've eaten British food is not entirely not surprising. Like the but on the other hand, the reverse happened a lot in that it's Indian food that's now become popular in the UK. So it's. That's <clears throat> it's reverse colonization in a way, almost. I think, um, I think it, it, sort of through the 70s and 80s, I think that the UK was able to um, look at itself and realize that our food culture was as, as, as impoverished as it could possibly be. And so we, we looked around. Um, and, and actually, the food now in the UK is, is, is pretty spectacular. And particularly, um, home food has improved hugely, although less than restaurant food but they've both got a lot better, and they've both got more aware of nutrition. But we could then get into the debate of, you know, do, uh, do you expect, as a TV chef, should you be telling people that they need to buy uh, an organic or at least free-range chicken that costs £13 for the bird, or do you uh, just anticipate that most people are going to buy a £2.50 bird, which will have much less taste and much less nutrition? It's a difficult question. What would your answer be? Uh, eat a very good chicken much less often. Yeah. So eat less industrialized food, eat real food, and if you can't afford it every day, don't eat it every day. That makes sense, right? Is the organic thing important in Indian food? This, we have a whole Ayurvedic characterization of food, particularly with temple food. But do we really care about the ingredients? Because one criticism of Indian food is that we are so obsessed with the preparation, with the spices. When it says rice, it says rice. We don't care that much. Is that fair? Uh, maybe. Uh, no? Partially, yes. But uh, as far as the temple foods go, uh, there is a kind of a balance. Um, uh, they have medicinal properties, some of these foods which are offered to... Give me an example. Uh, like pepper, for instance. Yeah. Um, uh, pepper is uh, um, mixed with foods which are to be had, for instance, around the time you would imagine the digestion is slowing down. That would be towards the later part of the day. Um, similarly, milk. Um, I, I agree, there is a lactose intolerance issue there. All right, but, yeah. uh, but still, no, Indians don't seem to be lactose intolerant. Yes, yeah. uh, at all. So um, that is to be ha had to, uh, towards the night, for instance, to give a good night's sleep. So um, various foods are timed according to the day. Uh, similarly, in the mornings, the food is full of energy. And although, of obviously, eventually... What, what temple food is full of energy? You know? All of it, you have to sleep immediately afterwards, all heavy. <laughs> no, but that is supposed to be had in small quantities, like a prashad, which, which then perhaps would not put someone to sleep. But uh, for instance, it's very uh, rich in ghee in the mornings. Yep. And that is supposed to uh, give you a lot of energy throughout the day without actually making you put on weight. Um, but of course, uh, in the form of a prashad. So um, someone... Does it know, work? I mean, are all pujaris very lean and... Most. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fat so most temples I've seen. I shall uh, refrain from commenting about <laughs> the right. look yeah. of the um, yeah. uh, pujaris. But uh, <clears throat> I have, obviously, all of us, many of us have tasted the uh, prashad. And we have, um, it's, it, the reason why it is so good and so um, tasty, delicious, is because it is in very small quantities. Uh, and um, that is how it should be consumed. I think that's something which Indians don't follow strictly. We, there's no limit on uh, how much we eat things which we love. That's true. I mean, do we actually eat too much as a people? Lathika, is that a 
Fair comment. Uh, that uh, uh, going back to your earlier point, you yeah. said that we don't care much about, like, if the, no, it's asked I, for the rice. moment I said rice and yeah. we didn't care, I, I, I knew there was no. going to be a Kerala <laughs> counter because yeah. that's the one state where we they do are, understand yeah. rice. We I are know. very particular right, okay. about our rice and our ingredients, yes. especially the rice, I think. Yeah. Because But Kerala is the one example rice. where even yeah. pepper. Yeah. They will talk about grades of pepper and yes. they will make much of yeah, it. Yeah. Rice, there will be a different rice for payasam, a different rice yes, for biryani. Exactly. So Kerala, I, yeah. I, I grant you that exa yeah. example. I think most of the southern states, and I'm guessing maybe in, in the north where you use wheat, uh, it would be the same, right? No, because no. Because no, any no. old wheat will do? No. <laughs> I'll give you an example. I, mean, I don't know if there are any chefs in the audience, but most mutton, what we call mutton in India, is goat. Yeah. Goat is now a very trendy meat in America because goat, pound for pound, has less fat than most of the chickens you'll buy in the shops. But in America, if you go and buy goat, they will ask you what breed of goat it is, yeah. what cut, how old is the goat. 99% of Indian chefs, you ask them what the breed of the goat is, they look at you like you're mad. Yeah. 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 That's right. We don't have that consciousness in India. Go on. But that's unfortunately true, I find, with a lot of fishmongers, apart from top-end fishmongers in the UK, yeah. is that I'll say, well, where did this prawn come from? We know prawns range from something that's basically been raised on detritus to something that is utterly delicious and very pure. Um, and, and, and I'm always shocked by how many fishmongers I go to who simply do not know about the product that they're selling. Yeah. What's well, true of this great basmati con? like all Indians, but not in Kerala, I hasten to add, believe that Basmati is like the great rice and therefore we'll pay more for it. Now what they've done in laboratories in India is done tests <coughs> and worked out that though Basmati has a nutty flavor, a buttery smell, etc. Most of us, because we make it in pulao or biryani, add so much masala that the original flavor is gone. So when we say Basmati, what we are reacting to is the size of the grain. So they've now created hybrid rice in various laboratories which look like Baspati, have none of the other qualities, and are sold and exported as Baspati, and nobody in India knows or cares. Except for the guys who sell it, who make a huge profit, but the rest of us don't even care. No? That's one of the problems with India, except yeah. Kerala, <laughs> is that we're not that aware of our ingredients. No, it's not just Kerala. I think a lot of communities no, no. are going back to their old rices. I mean, no, varieties no. of hill, hill rice, wild rice. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of health food shops with... Know, wild rice, rice is not an Indian rice. Uh, no, it is. There are a lot There's of... There's no Indian tradition. Wild rice is an aquatic grass, which is not of Indian but origin. But rice is a grass. Wheat is a grass. But not, so, not an aquatic grass like So if like you go wild. to the northeast, you have red rice. And you, you have bamboo rice in bamboo the northeast. Rice yes. Well. So the northeast, yes, but the rest of India, no. Yeah. Bamboo rice actually grows in the south also, in Kool. Really? Yeah, is, yeah, is it yeah. part of? Yes. Just explain to people what bamboo rice is. Because bamboo also, rice is ba basically, it's not, it's not your It's not rice. rice but it's, like, but it's, a, it's rice in the sense it's the seeds of the bamboo that fall onto the ground and it's a great delicacy in any bamboo growing area. The rats also love it. So usually there's a saying that when uh, the bamboo flowers and uh, sheds its, uh, its uh, grains, I mean it, its rice, There'll be a famine in the land soon after that. Because so, uh, the rats come in and they multiply so much. And then after that, they go looking for the rice in the granaries. Mm. So that's when you have to protect your rice. So if it's a, if it's a seed, yeah. uh, does that mean it's protein, not carbohydrate? No, it is carbohydrate. Because oh, okay. yeah. quinoa, of course, is the... It, but it's, it's, it's not a protein, yeah. but it's a, it's a vegetable. It it's not a vegetable. grain. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. it's yeah. got a bit of a mixture. Yeah. yeah. It's so not it's a, a carbohydrate seed, in the sense as, that vegetables are carbohydrate. Yeah. It's not a starch. Yeah. Yeah. But in, to, oh, sorry. Go on. It, there's another special rice. Since we're talking about rice in Kerala, it's called Nyavara rice. And Tell us about it. Uh, it is in, uh, what did you say? Tell us about the yeah, rice. Yeah, Nyavara rice is a medicinal rice. You need to hold rice. the mic a little closer. It's yeah. a medicinal rice that is actually consumed during the monsoons. And as you can see, we are passionate about our rice. So is yep. Tamil Nadu, where I live right now. And there's, there are rices that you have through the year. So there's not just one rice you have. It's, and it's definitely not basmati. There's a tiny grain rice. There's a medicinal rice that you make into a porridge uh, during the monsoons because you need nourishment from that. And in fact, it's in my new book, Mother Earth, Sister Seed. There's a 
uh, recipe for making this medicinal rice and during the monsoons. Okay. And uh, it's one of the things, not just Syrian Christians, all over Kerala. It's an Ayurvedic rice also. Okay. Fine. Yeah. So I'm going I'm to throw I, this open. Any questions? Can I just ask a really quick question? Yes, go ahead. So you can, if you can ask the first question. If yeah. it's for eating during the monsoon, does that mean it's very high in vitamin C? So that you it don't, is. It's full. Yeah. It's full. It's, it's it's a nutritional so supplement in every way. And so against respiratory yeah. disease. Yeah. yeah, and very few farmers grow it. It's it's a difficult rice to grow. Mm. So by definition, definition, it's a grass, but it's also a wild grass, mm. and very difficult to cultivate. Like many mm. of the other yeah. things, and uh, these are the, the older grains. These are yeah. the things that needs need to be. Yeah. Uh, subsidized by the governments now to go yeah. back to our old ways yeah. of eating. In Tirupati, they don't have any wild rice. Either. Normal no, no. white rice. No? Absolutely. Nothing yeah. wild about it. Also, yeah. I was just trying to uh, you know, comment upon what you had said earlier that yeah. why, don't, why aren't we aware of so many different varieties? Yeah. Uh, Indians mostly have one or two kinds of rice which yeah. are available in the market or through our uh, ration shops, or uh, mainly that is what we consume. So there's also the problem of availability of these different varieties in the, in the mainstream yeah. food. I, think that's I also think that we forget this now. Your generation probably doesn't remember this. But for many years, all grains came from ration shops. Yes, they you took what you got. Yes, you yes. didn't have the advantage of going and looking for a particular kind of wheat Absolutely. or rice. Absolutely. And yeah. even now in the villages, in most of the uh, uh, areas where they don't have access to uh, organic or labeled organic food, yeah. ration shop happens to be the main source yeah. of grain. And there is they only have one or two kinds of rice. That's all the expensive <coughs> one and the cheaper, cheaper. one. That's all. And you're lucky to eat most times, yes. It's yes. So you don't really have the luxury of choosing. Absolutely. Yeah? So uh, there isn't too much uh, deliberation on, you That's know. right. These yeah. are all sort of later and middle class preoccupations now, Precisely. unfortunately. Precisely. Yeah. All right. Okay. Sorry. I was going to throw this up. Well, good. Many, many questions. Okay. Good. But, 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 you, but as you don't have a microphone, you can't actually ask India. your question. This gentleman can. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, thank you for a wonderful talk, all three smart ladies. So it's uh, to you. It's uh, it's not a question. It's a rhetoric question. So you can choose to comment with Sarah. Is it a speech Sarah. or is it a question? No, it's just a straightforward. If it's a speech, straight I will be rude and cut you. No, no, no. Okay. Sarah, thank you for uh, letting us know about food because you know mechanic won't tell how to keep the car good. He makes his job by repairing it. So same with the doctor. So it is a speech. Good, thank you. No, just a small <laughs> comment and, okay. and thank you for telling uh, about you know recipes because my grandmother's recipe of pickles is lost. My mom makes it in one day. She made it in seven. And for Kota, by the way, wonderful name. Uh, you, know, you, you. you didn't touch upon the it's topic of... It's not a speech, of, it's an SMS. I mean, no. Uh, what you point didn't are touch, you making? So the question to Kota <laughs> is that you didn't touch upon uh, the food wastage, like how they pour milk on shivling. That's uh, a good point. That's so, the question. So, uh, it's never consumed. It goes into the Good. drain, yep. which poor people can drink. Uh, shivling. You thought of whether a god feels hungry. I used to think when I was a child whether God has a link. Does he have a penis? Does he need it? Uh, either he has a big one like a shivling or like Gabriel, you know, in Christianity who doesn't you have a penis. You were doing fine till now. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So it's two, three. All right. <laughs> Wastage in temples. I think that was, there was a question there somewhere about that. It's a serious problem, no? Yes, absolutely. But um, I was researching on the Tirumala temple and uh, the food is never wasted there simply because uh, the food which comes out of uh, that particular temple has a lot of value uh, among the devotees. As I, I think I started my uh, presentation with that, that it's a matter of faith. It's all a matter of faith and the separation of faith, faith from if, doubt. If there's wastage, what has faith got to do with it? That's what I'm saying. If uh, there was more faith, food wouldn't be wasted. Good one. Good answer. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Yes, sir. Finally, we will give you a microphone. Can we give the gentleman a microphone? Thank you very much. By the way, I landed up here and uh, such an appropriate place. I'm going to South. We are having Platinum Jubilee. I'm from Army. Colonel Mathur is my name. For about five, ten days, we are going to be in that area of backwaters. And we are celebrating it. I just want to ask you, ma'am, specifically, yeah. what food should I not avoid and come back and repent here? Yeah, 
Okay. So can you just guide me One on that? One of the specialties of the backwaters is the curry. It's called curry yeah. mean. It's called pearl spot. It's a very special fish. We are going to be at Cherai. You are going to Chennai. Chennai. Okay. Cherai, Cherai. Oh, Cherai. Cherai, Cherai is in the then, near the backwaters. Yes, it's a beach. Yeah. And then we are taking a cruise. We are coming back, and all the whole lot of regimental okay. people. Okay. <laughs> Later she'll give you a full menu, but at the moment she'll give a quick no, answer. Something. Quick I should answer. not repent. I'm from Ready. Jaipur, Pink City. Okay. Are you I, vegetarian? No, uh, uh, both mockatarian. Okay, okay. <laughs> that sir was staring on some days we are vegetarian, <laughs> some day we have fast, okay. some party, some are egg vegetarian. You know, so many varieties of people are there. I would say Very go good. to a toddy shop. Why do you shop? want to snatch young lady? This mic, you are so beautiful and charming. <laughs> you have this Binaka smile. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Good I, question. I, if you are so going to the backwaters, we've got the question. I no, he's, gonna he's not going to Kerala. He's going to Chennai. No, Ch he's, he's going to Chennai. Chennai. Chennai is Chirai. In the oh, right, near okay. the backwaters. Sorry, backwaters. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So I, I think you should go to a toddy shop, and they'll give you the it's best. It's really it's disgusting really and foul. Food. I don't have it. Okay, go on. You'll get toddy, and you'll get fish, and you'll get all the special. What is toddy, ma'am? Toddy. Okay. <laughs> it is you don't a local want to know. Group. It's a local uh, brew. Ma'am, we, huh. we in Army are experts Sir. on liquor. Okay. So please leave the liquor part. Just tell me the food part. Oh, there's a lot of food over there. You right. get the best food in a toddy shop. So you probably... Ajay, okay. Your, okay, yeah, okay. your boat might, your houseboat might stop near a toddy right, shop. Right, right. We are doing that. Yeah, so you do that. Thank you very much. And thanks for leaving this bike for a little longer to me. Thank you. Somebody there. This, right behind. Yeah. Right next to you, I think. It's Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, there's a belief that local cuisine has evolved over Hello, generations. Who's asking the question? I can't see anything. Please stand up and ask me. There's a belief that uh, uh, local cuisines have evolved over generations, and they're quite scientific in terms of, you know, uh, catering to the, uh, the environment there, the climate, and the kind of uh, work the people do. So one, uh, my first question is, do you agree with that? And then the second one is in modern times today, with the intermixing of all kinds of cuisines from all over the world, are we losing out in terms of the inherent sort of nutritional balance that uh, uh, people used to have in the earlier days? All right, Sarah, that's clearly for you. I think it's, um, yes, of course, if you are doing a, a, a manual laboring job, um, you will need a hugely different amount of calories to if you're sitting at a computer all day. And there's very interesting research coming out at the moment that people who sit at computers all day should actually, every 15 minutes on their iPhone, which of course everybody has, or their laptop, get up and walk around for two or three minutes and have meetings standing up. Anyway, that's a slightly different thing. But the lack of activity is obviously key, and it should completely dictate the diet that you have and simply doesn't. I mean, we have completely lost the link between a high calorific diet and a very active life and a, and a low calorific diet for a very sedentary life. But also, taking your thing about locality, one of the things that has also happened is that with the increasing globalization of seed types, what used to happen is that you would hand your seed from one neighbor to another neighbor, and that particular seed would do particularly well in your own microclimate, in your valley, in your village, whatever. And that is now gone, and, and, and largely because of, uh, of global legislation about having to register seed varieties, and that is expensive. And um, I mean, I, I run a seed company, and we actually have been prosecuted for doing seed sharing because we haven't got registered varieties. We have local varieties. And that is very erosive of good, nutritional, local food. Um, as well as overlaying a thing where you, you have no relationship between what you put in your mouth and what you do activi uh, actively apart from go to the gym, which again, there is interesting research that the, the whole relationship with the gym where vitamin D levels are low, et cetera, it's a very different thing to actually getting exercise out in a field. So there's, there's, huge, there's so many things that you've tapped into with that question, really. So there's a view. It's been the subject of many bestsellers in America, including Wheat Belly, suggesting that one reason why people react badly with degrees of varying degrees of intolerance to wheat is because we are no longer using the old wheat strains that our ancestors were used to. It's now this commercial industrial wheat that's seeds that are planted by huge American multinationals and don't necessarily agree with us. Where do you stand on that? Partly that, so partly the, the, the actual grain, 
but also, equally importantly, perhaps more importantly, the process by which the bread is made. So that is why there is a massive sourdough explosion okay. in the West, because the whole process of having a fermented start to a bread rather than a yeast, so a naturally fermented culture, which you keep in your fridge and you feed like your baby, but it sits in the fridge, um, and, and having a fermented bread gives it a chewier, more long-lasting yeah. um, texture, and so it doesn't need to be in the fridge, which is good, but also gives you a much a more nutritious uh, loaf than you would get. So again, it's partly grain, but it's also partly it's also the cooking the process. process, which is what everybody <coughs> is talking about. Okay. Uh, let us the ladies in Comic. I think one of them. You choose whichever you want to ask her. Okay, okay, both ask her. Thank you so much. This is in relation to your interesting uh, question. Will you hold the mic nearer you? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. This is in relation to your interesting question, does God really get hungry? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I was just thinking about it, and uh, I think that most of uh, us believe in Sagun Brahman, that is we tend to humanize the God. Absolutely. And one way of showing love uh, to uh, another human being is offering food. So uh, what is your take on that? So That's that is where yeah. the concept of Naivide comes from. Absolutely, uh, yes. What is your take? That's, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Well, that's exactly what got me into researching and eventually writing this book. Um, as the gentleman here had also mentioned about the wastage, you know, the, we, are a, we are not an entirely wealthy country. Food for us has always been scarce. And uh, as I said, my own research in the villages among the poor and understanding poverty of this country had made me wonder why would people go to the extent of putting their meager income and earnings into offering um, these foods to God. But you are absolutely right that, you know, there is an imagination of God as a human being. And not just any human being, someone very close to the person, the devotee, someone who totally understands the devotee. And therefore, when the the person um, he or she wants to offer food to God, it's almost as if the food is being offered to oneself. And that's why the, uh, the, the concept of food being Brahma, as in uh, the food which is being offered, is also a, a manifestation of God. Um, so, but that comes in the context which is of reality, the sociological, the economic reality of this country. And that's where my book had started from, you know, that, that location of it in the kind of reality we live in this country. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right. Somebody else? Yeah, yeah. I said you could both ask. Right? We'll give you the mic. So you all are writers. And uh, when you are in process of writing your book, what kind of a diet you maintain in your daily eating? All of them. That's a good question. All right. Only when they're writing the book or otherwise also? Only when they're writing the book, okay. Let's start with you. So when you were writing your book at Tirupati, did you have a lot of prashad? Um, <laughs> no, of course, I mean, one had to. Yeah. If it was mandatory, it wasn't required. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the fun part. But uh, writing a book also requires uh, one to sit at the desk for uh, a considerable period of time every day. So I generally try to keep the carbohydrates low during that time because I can't somehow think clearly when I have too much of um, rice, wheat, bread. You'll go hungry in Tirupati if you keep the carbohydrates I, low. No? I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, so mostly I'm on a fruit and milk diet. Um, I am not lactose intolerant, <laughs> so I can also get away with it. But uh, fruits and milk mostly, yeah. Okay, all right. Latika, yeah, when you write a book, what do you eat? And what do you eat when, when you're not writing a book? <laughs> yeah. When I was writing my recipe book, I was trying out a lot of the recipes. So obviously, I was doing a lot of that, eating my own Syrian Christian food, lots of coffee too. But I recently wrote another book on farming. So that was interesting. I was trying out far farm foods from farms all over India. And uh, uh, for one whole week, I tried to forage food. So I wanted to see what I could gather from my garden and the area. I live in the mountains. So I was experimenting a lot with foods, trying to find out why people think of only rice as food or wheat as food when there's actually food everywhere. 
there's food actually to be found everywhere. So interestingly, I was trying to sort of live the lives of the people I was writing about. Okay. That's very René Redzepe. Uh, <clears throat> Sarah, what do you... Uh, uh, there's only one answer to that in my view, which is far too much, because you're <laughs> recipe testing, so you're just eating all day. And so actually you don't have normal meals. Um, you know, breakfast, dinner, lunch, when you're recipe... I mean, my books tend to have four or 500 recipes. It's very arduous, and actually um, you long for rubbish in a way, but you eat far too much. I always put on weight when I'm doing a book because I'm, I'm eating all the time. Okay. So answer your question is two of our writers eat more because they're eating on, our, on the job. And one of them is very holy with her food and eats only milk and fruit. All right. Hardly. All right. The lady there. A lot of food discoveries and our thing new. Mike, near you, ma'am. Even I can't hear you. Huh? Lot of new food discoveries and earth another discoveries are being made about food daily. What was very good for you once has become poison and what is what was poison for you is a superfood now. To give examples, milk and soda by carb. Which is the institute you look to to get the right answers? Because quite a few times these things are advertisements also. That's a good that's a good question. It is Of course we're all gonna it? say our books. <laughs> but, but genuinely, for instance, grains, which the U.S. recommended so heavily in the 1970s, are now being held responsible for the obesity <coughs> epidemic. Eggs, which were considered villains now, are not necessarily villains. So what is the ordinary person to do? That's very... Um, I, I, I don't think you should go to a cookbook. I think you should go to um, your, your, the cooking heritage of uh, healthy, you know, healthy people that you know. I mean, I, I think the Mediterranean diet has a lot. It, it's, it's, it's been eaten for millennia. There is huge evidence from the Seven um, Nations study that the Mediterranean diet you know, is the one across the world that is best for you. Um, lots of olive oil. Uh, sheep and goat dairy rather than cow, lots of fish, not too much meat, huge amounts of vegetables of a good cross-section. You know, they're, they're just, that doesn't change. So don't, I don't think we need to be faddist. I think, you know, there are some sort of absolute pillars of a healthy diet. Um, okay. And don't buy the faddist books. Okay. I think we can do one or two more questions. Uh, is there anybody in the back who I haven't noticed so far? Somebody there at the corner who I haven't noticed, yeah. Uh, this actually is not a comment about food, uh, but it's a comment about the questions that have been asked. Yeah. And the sexism I've seen and heard here. Talking about uh, having a binaka smile. What on earth does that have to do with food? Except that we may have clean teeth with that. I would like that kind of uh, dialogue and uh, in words, that's what JLF is supposed to be about, words, to be called out, even when we talk about something which is not directly related to Who food. Who said Binaka smile? Oh, there was a gentleman out there, two gentlemen out there. Mafi Maglo, yeah. No, it's not a question of yeah, Mafi, yeah. please. All right. It's a question of yeah, real yeah, we, awareness. We got, yeah, I yeah. would have liked you to have called them out well, rather I, than waiting well, for I me didn't, to come and, and I, do I that. I didn't, I'm sorry, please sit down. Next. That right. is sexist yeah. again, shutting no, them down like that. No, ma'am. I really don't need to be told off by you whether you're a man, woman, or animal. Next, yeah. Ask a question. Give her a microphone, please. Here, yeah. microphone here. Yeah. Uh, hi, so my question is on binge eating. So you know sometimes, like you're not hungry, you're not too hungry, but you're hungry. And you end up, you know, picking up the next bag of chips that's right next to you. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so ha and that, you know, like, like your dad goes for the toss when you do that. And you do that more often. So how do you, like, balance your diet off with that, you know, binge eating coming in? Okay, is binge eating ever right, sir? Um, fasting is, 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 is proven to be an incredibly important uh, role in preventing binging. Basically, again, as, as, a, as most animals without um, discipline, once we start eating, our instinct is to continue. 
Um, it's partly a social thing. It's, it's partly a culture thing. Uh, but actually, breaking it with a day of fast, uh, perhaps even just a fast between six in the evening and, and lunchtime the next day, one o'clock the next day, it, it, it resets that instinct to, to excess. And, and there is more and more research that fasting on a relatively regular, once a week, once a fortnight, is, is a really important thing. And to do it for a week every six months is unbelievably valuable and seems to be one of the things that can really reset uh, weight issues in obesity. Okay, I think we can do one or two more. You've asked a question already, haven't you? You haven't, all right, the lady there. Yeah, hi, my question is to Kota. When you started, you said that uh, you were a big skeptic. So what was the conclusion in your book? Well, um, I would recommend that you read the book uh, to find out, but to answer the you said you would tell us. Yeah, right. right. So I know. So um, one of the things I discovered is uh, that faith is a very personal thing, uh, especially when you make a connection with God. It's a personal connection. My, my, where I was coming was, uh, I was coming from a place of discontent. I had uh, seen the poverty of this country. I researched this for over 15 years. And... I was uh, perhaps angry with God, and I was especially angry, not for myself, but because of the people, the way they pray to God for simple solutions, which also don't, they don't get. And they, that's where I was coming from. So no, I, I don't think I found the answers to those, and that's, uh, that's why I continue with my research um, in, among the people, uh, among the people of uh, so country. you're still, are you still skeptical? I'm, I'm still yeah. skeptical, uh, but I have found one answer which may be useful is that, uh, as I said, it's a very, very personal um, equation with God. And, and when, when something is being offered to God, it's, it's a matter of uh, offering oneself the same thing. It's not, it's, the God is not separate from oneself. And although it may be a spiritual position, it's not really a religious position, it's not a really ritualistic position, but that is perhaps where uh, there is a slight glimpse of an answer hmm. to the kind of doubts I had. It's a good, it's a good answer. I think we can do one more. Who we got? The, who we got? All right, ma'am, the very enthusiastic lady who's been waving. Her. My question is to Nilima, ma'am. Okay. Oh, can you uh, briefly describe on Chappan Bhog? What's that? Uh, clearly, it, it talks about, uh, you know, a diverse food, you know, preparations being offered to God. Now, here is an important thing. Whether it's Chappan Bhog or whether it's um, celebrations like Diwali, where an extraordinary array of, you know, uh, um, food is offered to God. I think it's, that's what I was saying. It's also a community celebration. It is not an individual celebration. So it's not a display of wealth. It should not be, ideally, that's what the plan was. But it should be the display of the communities uh, um, coming together, celebrating a particular event. So that's more a, a spirit of togetherness. And obviously, it also is a reflection of prosperity of that particular community. So that's where we come back to the same doubt that if the community is not prosperous, then how do we continue with these rituals? All right. I think, oh god, there's still so many. All right. I'll take one from that lady, and then we'll end it. Yeah? All right. We'll give you a microphone. We are completely out of time. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi. My name is Dr. Deepa Sharma, and uh, my question is to you all. Uh, you guys are talking about good food, and uh, have you been successful uh, in your own home, uh, among your relatives, among your children or siblings, 
to tell them about good food in real practicing and implement implementing like okay. uh, we teach them a lot we tell them but they don't follow i am a ayurvedic doctor i have done even masters in clinical nutrition dietetics also i tell my patient daily about good food but most of them are like very ignorant they tell doctor just give us some medicine we are not able to follow diet regularly <laughs> but so you mean they don't listen yeah sometimes right, it happens all right. okay yeah. all right do people listen sarah um my husband no <laughs> um <laughs> he's the worst um but actually my children so if we're talking about home are have a healthier diet than i ever had and and healthier perhaps even than me i think there is a change in the generations but with the older generation i think there's still a real problem that i think that there is a sort of in our country anyway i there is a sort of um a thing that if you take your diet seriously somehow you're being indulgent or it's sort of somehow um it's it's sort of not quite right uh and there's a very strange thing that that you can put rubbish into your self and expect to live a long life but i think that has definitely changed and um i believe that is also changing here very much and certainly in the states and stuff but um i think it's hard i think having three or four good recipes for children when they're leaving home going off to university whatever is really really key and that's what i did with my children is i taught them three or four things that were cheap that were healthy that were easy that were quick just and just for reference what three things So I I taught them a kale and chickpea curry with coconut milk. Okay. And they can literally buy a green curry paste if they're feeling lazy and they need it to be quick. And the recipe is in your book. Oh, uh, 4 or 500. All right, all right. Um uh, I I I taught them a soup, um a roast tomato soup. The thing about soup, um sorry, tomatoes is that they have um a v- really fantastic antioxidants and a, a cooked tomato is more nutritious than an uncooked tomato so sun dried or su- or sort of somehow dried tomatoes or tomato paste have an incredibly high level of the single lycopene in them so i taught them that that is also based on coconut milk rather than dairy it has a lot of ginger in it it's very good and warming so i taught them that i'm afraid i did teach them one pasta dish which is based on anchovies capers uh, and olives a putinesco med classic mediterranean thing um and well those three will do and they listen and the what and they listen they and actually. they listen and they do cook them often and when i get home sometimes when they've been at home in the sink because they haven't done the washing up i can see they've also cooked it so yeah i think just a very limited repertoire of things that are quick easy delicious and healthy what well, there are still so many people with questions we could go on i'm now 5 minutes overtime alas so a big hand for our panel thank you very much thank you Thank you so much that was a wonderful session we'd like to thank Nilima Latika Sara and Veer Sangvi for being with us here today our next ses- session begins in another 5 minutes the session is about innovations in healthcare and we will have Siddharth Bhattacharya and William A